when I put my hands in the soil, I'm channeling thousands of years of ancestors who came before me and did the same. And it's this connection that I feel we've lost in our modern world of cities and concrete. And it's very, very empowering and also comforting, too, that, you know, you're doing something that has been done for thousands of years. You're growing food to feed not just yourself, but your family, your neighbors, your community. A movement is underway of people abandoning the emotional, physical, and financial expenses of city living and crafting their own purpose, livelihoods, and joy in the rural reaches. The Urban Exodus podcast shares the wisdom, wit, and stories of those who decided to embark on the road less traveled to pursue their own interpretation of the good life. Small business owners, change makers, artists, farmers, and more, working towards building a better future for themselves and their fellow citizens. This podcast is for country dreamers, rural folk, and urban dwellers alike who want to feel more connected to the natural world and the purpose and choices in their lives. I'm Alyssa Hessler. Welcome to the Urban Exodus. Welcome to the season three finale of the Urban Exodus podcast. Wow, I can't believe that we've come so far. A couple years ago, my thought to expand the written features into a podcast was just a dream. And now we're on episode 35. It has been such an evolution to let people tell their own stories in their own words. I have learned so much from the myriad of incredible folks that I've had the opportunity to speak with. I hope that the wisdom that they shared will stick with you as you pursue your own interpretation of the good life. We launched the podcast in the midst of the pandemic in 2020. This has been a devastating, difficult, but also a very powerful time. I think most of us have felt some level of internal transformation as we reevaluate how we measure happiness, success, and fulfillment. It has become obvious how fragile our systems of convenience are. And in response, people have pulled up their sleeves and gotten to work to find solutions. We can't go back to normal. Normal won't work if we want future generations to thrive. We have to fix this mess that we've made. We have to be solutionaries, building strength and resilience at home and in our local communities, tearing up lawns and vacant lots to grow food, looking out for our neighbors, and supporting businesses that are doing right by their employees and the planet. It is my passion and life's purpose to find and amplify these stories. The people I've met through this project give me hope for the future. Thank you so much for listening and for supporting. It means the world to me that you find value here. Now, without further ado, I'm excited to invite you to my conversation with Natalie McGill. Natalie is a farmer and farm educator living on the Eastern shore of Virginia. Natalie grew up in the East Coast suburbs, but decided she wanted to farm at a young age. She met her partner, Stuart, in college, and they connected through their shared passion for agriculture, ecology, and animals. They both wanted to avoid chasing the consumer-driven version of the American dream and instead learn to live off the land and in harmony with nature. In 2010, fresh from college, the couple wed and Natalie's parents offered them access to family land to build their homestead. At first, they had no idea what they were doing, but they were committed to learning how to grow enough food to feed themselves. They worked odd jobs and learned about various sustainable agriculture practices through trial and error. What began as a homestead garden eventually grew up into a diversified farm business. Now they run a CSA and farm store that provides meat and fresh produce to their community. They currently grow vegetables 
raise a myriad of heritage livestock breeds, and host workshops for apprenticing farmers. In our conversation today, we speak about biodynamic practices, the magic of growing, the impacts of an erratic and changing climate on farmers and our current food system. This is a story of initiative, passion, and celebrating and working with the natural world. I hope you enjoy. So I'm really excited to have on the show Natalie McGill, who is farming in Accomack County in Virginia. And I have followed your journey online for quite some time. You and your husband are running a regenerative farm, and you also do a lot of teaching and inspiring other people to kind of get their feet wet in regenerative agriculture and practices. So first off, I'd love to hear a little bit of your personal backstory, where you grew up and your journey to where you are now. I grew up in Maryland in the suburbs outside of Baltimore and D.C. Frederick, it's in the Catoctin Mountains in the small little town right outside of Frederick, Maryland. All of my childhood, it was in the suburbs, but I always, I've been kind of like a wild nature child always, and I've always really enjoyed being outdoors. I grew up riding horses, and I worked on a horse farm growing up. And also my dad, he, wherever we have lived, and we did move like around the suburbs a bit in my first like seven years, but wherever we've lived, including um, the, the place where I spent the majority of my childhood, he's always kept a Zen garden. He's always like tended to create like this beautiful little forest habitat in the midst of his like suburban backyard. And he got that from his grandparents who were Japanese. And so I think that definitely had an impact on me when I was a kid. I would always say that when I grew up, I wanted to be a tree. I would always get like made fun of for that. And people would be like, well, you can't, that's impossible. And I'd be like, that's what I want to be when I grow up. I want to be a tree. And it's kind of funny because, you know, now I plant trees and it's really not that far off from my wish as a little kid. So then I went to college. That's where I met my partner, my husband. It was in Northern Virginia in a suburb outside of DC. We went to the same like small liberal arts school. And he majored in political theory. I was majoring in literature, but then I ended up switching my major to political theory. And part of like some of our classes in political theory was on like agrarianism. We studied Wendell Berry. And the kind of funny thing is that like out of all of our classmates, I guess we kind of took the agrarianism thought rather literally because we like just immediately wanted to jump like right into farming and homesteading. All of our friends, everyone else we knew like immediately went to DC for like these high powered internships. And we kind of just went the exact opposite direction. And so he was a couple years ahead of me. He graduated. He was still working in the area, but really like my last couple years, we were kind of just like constantly researching homesteading, how we could live more sustainably, grow our own food. And then as soon as I graduated, we moved down here to the eastern shore of Virginia. We had family land that was available, which we were so lucky to have that we could just like jump right in and do that. I'm like, most people could not do that, but we were able to. And yeah, we moved down here in 2010. We, I graduated college, we got married, and then we moved down here in like a matter of all of that happened in like three weeks time. <laughs> and yeah, we've been here ever since. So you were really young when you made your move. I was, I was 22. <laughs> <laughs> what did your parents and your family and your friends at college, how did they respond initially to this idea of kind of leaving 
this path of life that is expected of you when you leave college? Oh, gosh. Yeah. So, (laughs) so I have been really lucky in that my parents have been very, very supportive. They're just, they've been wonderful. I will say when I first brought this up, everyone, my parents, friends, they were like, you are crazy. Like, what are you thinking? My dad, he was like, okay, Natalie, you need to go to school for that. You can't just like jump into farming. (laughs) So I think everyone was like a little skeptical, a little worried. Like we had no idea what we were doing. And at the time, like I'm very stubborn. I come from a long line of incredibly stubborn women. And so I just like immediately got my back up and was like pushing back. But looking back now, I'm like, yeah, I can completely understand why my parents were concerned. Like why everyone was like, okay, are you sure you want to do this? It sounds kind of crazy. I can really understand that now looking back because we really had no idea what we were doing, what we were getting ourselves into. But we were really lucky that like my family had land. And even though they were skeptical, they were also very supportive. And we kind of came to this idea that, okay, we're going to move down here and like just kind of try a few things out, try to grow our own food, live a bit more slowly, very simply. And then also we were both going to work odd jobs from home and in the community until we, as we were kind of trying to figure out where it would go and what we wanted to actually do. What did that look like for you for the first couple of years? Because I know that you know, you had the privilege of having access to land, which is huge, but there's still a lot of startup costs involved with getting a farm business kind of up and running and figuring out your markets and all of that pain point time of setting up the infrastructure. We're in a very unique situation in terms of we already had the land available. And I'm so grateful to my family that it was here and they were willing to give it you know, give us a try. But yeah, the first few years, my husband, he is a web computer designer. So he is able, and he had started up that business in Northern Virginia. And so when we moved down here, he was able to easily transfer that business here. And it's also really nice for him too, because even to this day, he still does web design and web work. And it's nice because, you know, during our high season, during the spring and summer, he can take on less projects and jobs. And then during the winter, when we have more free time, he can take on more work. So that has offered us a really nice flexibility. And two, just at the beginning, we started off very small. We wanted to grow our own food. We started off with rabbits and chickens, and we were just kind of trying to see what worked for us and what didn't. And also, it was like we didn't really know what we were doing. (laughs) And so we had a huge learning curve. But in terms of like farm infrastructure and getting things up and running, it's really been a very slow kind of piecemeal process for us. So we already had the land, but yeah, there wasn't any fencing. We didn't have a tractor in the beginning, so it was all done by hand. The house here, which I grew up coming to and we would spend summers here when I was a kid, it's like, it's a very, very old rundown house. So we're still fixing it up, but that was another huge project from the very beginning. And so, yeah, it definitely was a slow process because, one, we didn't know what we were doing, but also we didn't have a lot of money. So we kind of, especially the first few years, just kind of had to make do with what we had. And we did a lot of carrying buckets of water to the animals by hand. I mean, looking back and like, oh my goodness, we were so crazy. Like, how did we have the energy for this? Like, we used to carry because we didn't have a well in the middle of the field for the animals so we would like just literally be carrying buckets of water out to them and back and in the summer it was awful and the same with like you know compost for the beds everything was done by hand initially it was good that you were young (laughs) yes it was it really I always like to say that 
I'm pretty sure that if my younger self like actually knew what I was getting into and the amount of work that it was going to entail, I probably wouldn't have wanted to do it. <laughs> yeah. But it's good that you got in early and young and then figured out your systems and, you know, you start to figure out how to streamline things and what systems you need, but growing slow. That's great. You are farming on the coast of Virginia. And for people not familiar with the region, I'd love for you to share a little bit about that area, kind of the history, the geography, what it looks like. It's an odd area. People seem to think of the Eastern Shore almost as like Virginia's appendix. It's supposedly non-essential, but the two counties that the shore makes up produce nearly half of Virginia's agriculture output, which is Virginia's number one private industry. So, but what's really funny is that often, even in Virginia, like we'll go into different restaurants or we'll see a map and the peninsula has just been entirely left off the map. It's just... (laughs) People tend to forget about us. And so it's this peninsula. We're sandwiched between the Chesapeake Bay on one side and the ocean on the other side. Nature here, I mean, it's just gorgeous. And something that's kind of this odd juxtaposition is everywhere you look, there are like billboards and signs that say, you'll love our nature. Oh, and something else really cool is that... um. We're living on the East Coast's largest migratory bird corridor. So we get all sorts of really cool birds. This time of year, it's always, we're dealing with all sorts of different hawks and falcons that are passing through on their migratory routes. So that's always interesting in terms of keeping the chickens and ducks safe. So yeah, you have nature here, which is beautiful, but then lots of factory farms and standard ag. So like tons of soy and cornfields, chicken houses. We actually butted up our farm right next to a chicken house and we rent a parcel of land from the man that owns a chicken house right next to us. So, and we're surrounded by corn and soy fields. The land that our farm is on, my parents leased to just like standard. It was no till at least, but soy and corn growers for, I mean, I think it had been farmed that way for decades. And it was very, very compacted when we first started farming. I mean, we could barely, there were some parts of the field, we could barely even like stick a shovel, just a shovel full down. It was, yeah. My husband and I drove up the entire peninsula there Gosh, I feel like it was 2016 or something. I was shooting some stories for Urban Exodus and he was shooting for a photo project that he was working on on rising sea levels. And I was just surprised at all of the uh, Tyson chicken and all of the factory chicken processing plants that were there. And then these like beautiful old farms like intermixed between it just really stuck out to me, that part. And so when I looked on a map before our interview, I was like, oh my goodness, she lives there. I'm (laughs) so interested to know about the kind of the history of it. So the land was once owned by your parents or maybe still is, but I'd love to hear what it means to you to be tending this land now and what the challenges and also the benefits are of living there. So yeah, the land is still in my family. We have been incredibly lucky in that it was available. I kind of feel, yeah, like anyone owning the land is really just owning land and trust for the future. I really hope that future generations will benefit from what we've done long after I'm gone. And I like to imagine that my own ancestors are proud. And it's kind of a special connection, too, because I grew up coming here playing in the woods here where we now grow mushrooms and run the pigs. So it's it feels very special. And I'm just like so honored that I can farm this land that I've had a connection to since I was just like five years old, a little kid. And yeah, I mean, it definitely has challenges. Yeah, as I said, we are surrounded by conventional soy and corn growers. One of 
our, so we planted a lot of bamboo hedges and just like hedges in general, not just bamboo, a lot of like native habitat hedges. We've kind of tried to rewild the edges of our forest and field. And when we first started doing that, just like letting it go and see what would pop up along the edges, we got a lot of flack from the neighbors of like, what are you doing? You're just letting it go back to forest. You're going to ruin the field. And one of our neighbors, <laughs> he farms 5,000 acres here on the shore. And he thinks that bees are poisonous. And so, and we've, you know, we've tried to have conversations. And I also feel like at this point, just like the fact that bees are pollinators and they're so valuable is pretty standard. But then like, you know, we come up upon things like this and I'm like, oh, maybe not. So it definitely has its challenges, but also, I mean, the soil, it's sandy loam. It's some of the best soil to grow, you know, on the East Coast. The region, I would say, it's probably one of the easiest places to grow whatever you want. We're pretty temperate. Now that is, it, it is changing a bit with climate change. That has definitely introduced some of its own challenges. But yeah, in terms of just like the ease of growing, the soil's great. We can, you know, we can really grow for most of the year. Not that that's always something I love. Sometimes I'm like, oh, I wish that. Well, it's funny. I always tease my husband that when we retire, we are going to move up to Maine. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm like, then it will be mandatory to like take the whole winter off. And I don't have to like feel bad or feel like I have to be growing things year round just because of the climate. That's a big draw for farmers to a certain degree. I mean, you usually end up with like kind of off farm work or, you know, web design work or other things that you can kind of fit in there. But you work so hard in the planting, tending and harvesting seasons that like you almost need that rest. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I'd love for you to offer any advice that you have for folks who are living in the city who want to leave, but maybe they don't know how to choose a community or a location that's right for them. You are going back to land that you knew that you were familiar with, but obviously it comes with its challenges. If you could have just chosen a place on a map, what steps would you suggest that they take to set themselves up for a successful transition? I would say... Try to figure out beforehand exactly like what you want to do. Obviously, not everyone is cut out to be a farmer. So maybe you just want to move outside of the city just to be in the country and have a garden and grow a bit of your own food. But yeah, definitely start small too. I would say it's better to like just grow a tiny garden perfectly than a huge garden terribly. You don't have to do everything. And figure out what you want, like what you're looking for. It can't just be like to get out of the city. So figure out, yeah, like what specifically you're looking for. Like, are you looking for community and, you know, different rural areas that will look very, very different. Is the weather important to you? Do you want a temperate climate or do you enjoy like a long winter with lots of snow? I feel like those things are very, very important. And also water, especially, well, water and then, you know, in the age of climate chaos and climate change, you know, what will the place you're looking like to move look for your kids if you have kids or what will it look like in even just 10 years? I think that's also very, very important. Since you have been connected to this land for so long and, you know, you've been connected to this community for so long and you're a farmer, which you know, farmers are the most connected to the rhythms of the natural world and to the weather. I'd love for you to talk about any changes that you've noticed to weather patterns or to the climate there since you've been there farming. The weather has definitely been changing. You know, it's hard to always correlate it directly to climate change. But we had a few years back now, I want to say for five years, a microburst event here on the farm. 
And it was really scary. So basically in the span of an hour, we got mm, seven, eight inches of rain. And I'd never seen anything like this. And so we have sandy loam soil, which drains incredibly fast. So we never experience any flooding here. It can rain for a couple of days straight. And then the next day, you know, we're fine to go out and work in the in the field. Everything has always drained very, very fast. And since we're surrounded by water, you know, we're only about like 30 some feet above sea level, which for here, you know, everyone jokes like it's really high, but we never experienced flooding. And so in this microburst, there was so much standing water and the water was actually like coming up to the second step on our porch, which I had never seen in all my years living here. And our neighbor who owns the chicken houses, he had also in all of his years living on the shore, I mean, he has lived in that same spot for his entire life. He had never seen anything like this. And he said that his feeling was that this is something that, you know, you used to call this something like this, the storm or the anomaly of the century. And he thinks that it's quickly becoming maybe not even just the storm of the decade, but soon it'll become, you know, pretty regular storms of the year. And since that happened four or five years ago, we also had another microburst event like that. And, you know, I had never, I didn't even know that word. I'd never even heard like that this was possible. But yeah, it's just like this random event. And what was so funny too, is that it was basically only over the town of Akamak. And we're like just outside the town limits. So it didn't happen anywhere else on the shore. Nowhere else got dumped with this amount of rain. It just happened like right here. And it was, yeah, it was crazy. And the water, it was standing. And there were some parts of the field where it was up to my knees almost. So, you know, we live in a region where I'd say we get 40 to 50 inches of rainfall annually. And so it's perfect for growing. We never get flooding. We don't have to worry about that. The soil's well draining. But the last few years, we have definitely been experiencing more drought, very, very dry springs, which has posed its own challenges in terms of pasture for the animals. And also, I will say, so July and August here, They're typically just my least favorite months to farm. I kind of hate farming. Then it's very, very hot, very humid. The humidity in July and August has gotten worse the last few years. And, you know, something that people always typically said they loved about the shore is its temperate climate. Because we're surrounded by water, we get a nice coastal breeze year-round, and normally it's at least fairly moderate. But the last few summers, I mean, the heat has just been absolutely brutal. So that's another thing we're kind of having to learn how to deal with because, you know, in heat like that, nothing really wants to grow. I mean, you know, anything you plant, especially greens, lettuce, it's just, it's really, really hard to keep a lot of plants like that going. Just in time for your holiday shopping, we are excited to announce our partnership with Kennebec Forge, a Maine-made heirloom quality garden hand tool business. Designed by Hostel Valley Living homesteader, Kirsten Lee Nielsen, and crafted by master blacksmith, Derek Glazier, founder of the New England School of Metalwork. Hand forged with locally sourced materials, these tools are as tough as nails and made to stand the test of time. They are the perfect gift for the cultivators in your life. This limited run is selling out fast. Get one before they're gone. Order by December 13th for Christmas delivery. Visit urbanexodus.com shop to learn more. I haven't ever heard the term microburst until right now, but in Maine, a couple of weeks ago, it rained five inches overnight and it washed out roads and people's homes were flooded up to the second story level. And just like never, we just never get that type of weather before. 
I just think it's really interesting to ask, you know, everyone, because people are located all over the country, what that looks like for them, because it's manifesting in different ways in different places. And farmers pay attention to the weather because, you know, if it's extra hot, you have to go feed your animals more water. Or if there's no rain, then you have to worry about, hey, there's like a huge hay shortage in Maine too, because we had a really hot June that was super dry. And so none of the grass grew. We're dealing with the exact same problem here. Hay shortage, because yeah, the last couple springs and then into early summer, we've just had a horrible drought. And so normally, you know, the grass is growing, the fields are lush and green, and that has just not been the case, which so has been a terrible problem. I wonder too, I mean, regenerative agriculture practices, I've done quite a bit of reading on them and it says that retaining moisture and being able to absorb moisture in regenerative like fields that have been regenerated through rotational grazing and whatnot, typically don't have the same flooding problems as, you know, monocrop industrialized agricultures do. Did you notice that your neighbors that were growing, you know, corn and soybeans, did they fare worse? Was there more water accumulation on their land? Definitely. I would say that, yeah, just like driving around the shore and like even just our neighbors, we noticed much more standing water in their fields. Whereas I think because we have fairly good established pastures that we have been working on for the past decade, we do have better draining soil and we are able to accommodate more water all at once than just like a monoculture of soy. You operate a biodynamic and a regenerative farm. And I'd love for you to explain kind of the principles of biodynamic growing for people who might not know much about it. So biodynamics, it's it's funny because I feel like it often gets relegated to kind of the fringe of regenerative agriculture. Sometimes quite fairly, there are a lot of, if not weird, at least it sounds weird up front. And often I feel like biodynamics can get stuck in this language that isn't accessible to everyone. And I am very much not of that mindset. So I like to just bring biodynamics right down to practical, common sense language. And I like to say that it's basically just working with the dynamics of life. In as much as anyone grows a plant successfully, they are working with the dynamics of life. As much as something is healthy and can nourish you, it is obeying some of these laws of life. And so biodynamics just wants to consciously work with those. And so in terms of our farm, I look at it as everything on our farm is interconnected. From the soil, to the cosmos, to the atmosphere, to the animals, plants, the microbial life, it's all interconnected. And if one thing is off or not healthy, then everything else is kind of thrown out of balance. Kind of like with your body. Like if I pull my lower back, suddenly I'm having to adjust like the way I sit, the way I walk, and it's throwing everything off kilter. And it's the same with your farm. And I feel like, you know, when we first got into farming, we just like jumped into homesteading, no experience, which I wouldn't recommend to anyone. I'm like, I wish that I had been able to intern somewhere first and really like figure out, you know, logistics, what I was getting myself into. But, you know, one of the problems that we had is that, From the beginning, from pretty early on, I just, I knew that I wanted to integrate animals and vegetables because I felt like it was a more holistic way of farming to integrate the two. And I just couldn't find anyone who was doing that the way that I envisioned it. And even even today, I feel like it, is pretty hard to find a lot of people that are integrating both. And actually, like, the number one reason 
why people come to us to learn or to intern, apprentice, is because they want to see how we integrate animals and vegetables because it's not very common. And for biodynamics, a huge part of biodynamics is soil fertility. And the cow is at the heart of this fertility, cow manure, grazing, rotational grazing, and integrating that into your garden. So biodynamics has a lot of what they call preparations, which are these different special composts made from manure and different herbs. And, you know, it sounds kind of weird at first. This is another reason why it's kind of often been relegated to like the fringe of regenerative ag. A lot of it like sounds like witchcraft because you're stuffing dandelion blossoms into bladders. And the main preparation, it's called cow horn manure. And we just actually made it last week. So you take the manure of a cow and we have cows. So we took the manure from our cows You kind of gather up a couple buckets and then you mix it for about an hour. So it's basically just like you're kneading dough for a sourdough bread. And as you're kind of like mixing it with shovels for an hour, the consistency starts to change a bit. And I like to throw in a couple handfuls of ground cornmeal that I grew that year, just as kind of like an offering to the land because our animals are giving their manure We're giving our time and intention. And then I like to give something back from the land that I also grew with intention. And cornmeal, it's not part of like the biodynamic recipe for this per se, but it's just kind of something that I like to do. So we mix that in. And then after an hour, we take the manure and we stuff it into cow horns. And then we bury them over winter. So You always do this kind of right around this time of year before the winter solstice. And then you bury them underground over winter until right around spring equinox. Sometimes you leave them in a bit longer. It depends on where you live and how harsh or mild your winter is. But then when you unearth the cow horns, you find this perfectly composted black gold. And it makes an amazing compost tea that you can spray back out onto the land. But what I find truly inspiring about this entire practice is that it empowers the individual to create their own nitrogen. Something that um, I think is kind of a problem in organic farming in general is that we tend to rely so much on nitrogen and outside inputs in order to be able to grow the amount of vegetables that we need to grow to support ourselves. And this, we are creating our own nitrogen, creating our own soil fertility off of the farm so we don't have to rely on bringing in all sorts of outside inputs, tons of compost, fertilizers. This is a way to kind of help make the loop, close the loop a bit more. Yeah, it's a closed cycle. Yes, and make just everything a little bit more sustainable. And, you know, we still do have to buy in some compost, but it's definitely helpful in terms of just kind of closing that loop, integrating the animals and the vegetables so we're not relying so much on outside inputs. And I find it, it's just very empowering. Like, you can create your own nitrogen, which I know, like, that's a huge cost for most, especially vegetable farmers. But to be able to create some of your own nitrogen, which then you can add back into your farm beds to grow the vegetables, that to me, I just, I love that part of biodynamics. How did you learn that? Are these looking back on kind of indigenous practices of cultivation? Or do you know kind of who the, you know, founders are of these practices? It's really interesting. Rudolf Steiner in the 1920s founded Biodynamics. He was German and he kind of founded it. He gave this series of lectures 
because he was concerned with the industrialization of agriculture. And at that time, they were using tons of synthetic fertilizers that were having some disastrous consequences on the land. But the part of biodynamics that I appreciate is the intention. And I feel like spiritual intention is hardly a recent innovation. So indigenous practices incorporate many of the things that then had to be kind of almost rediscovered in Europe. And biodynamics is this attempt to return to indigenous principles in the wake of industrialism. And it shows us that we don't simply have to remember how people used to do things, but we can also create new ways of doing them at the same time. So at once, it's incredibly revolutionary, but still honoring these old ways of doing things with intention and of also just using what the land has to offer you. Because another part of biodynamics is you take all of these different herbs like nettles and chamomile, valerian, and you um, compost them to make different sprays to spray out on the land. And what I love about that is that most of the herbs that are part of these compost preparations, they grow worldwide. You can find them growing net like nettles. They grow pretty much everywhere across the world in one form or another. And so while the roots of biodynamics were in Germany and they were definitely Anglo-centered, I feel like a lot of it, he was just borrowing and honoring these practices that existed long before the industrialization of agriculture. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of these like regenerative farming practices and stuff are, you know, looking back and being like, oh, <laughs> this actually, what we used to do worked really well. <laughs> Maybe we should go back to that so that we don't kill the soil. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. One thing that I always like to say is that like, you know, we have all of these buzzwords now of biodynamics and permaculture and regenerative and that's fine. And I get that like everyone wants to classify themselves just in terms of marketing and how you present your farm. Like, you know, you need these classifications, but at the same time, I feel like really all of these things, despite their attempts to like you know, make each one unique and different and classify separately. They're really just this attempt, like this realization that, okay, the industrialization of farming didn't work. CAFOs don't work. Like, let's go back and examine how, you know, indigenous people across the world for centuries stewarded and cared for the land. Yeah, absolutely. You summed it up right there. I feel like there's a lot of buzzwords and, you know, it's easy to write a book with a word that's going around, but it's all that same connection of like, let's look back and do this the right way because we went in the wrong direction. I really appreciate how intentional and thoughtful your approach to growing food and raising animals is. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the slow food arc of taste catalog and how that impacted your decision-making process on what animals to raise. Oh, yeah. So slow food arc of taste, it's really this cool compendium. A lot of research has gone into it and for both animals and vegetables. And it's really just animals and vegetables with kind of a historic lineage. They've been around for a while. They've been specifically adapted to different regions. And, you know, it exists across the world. I think the original one actually was started in Italy in an attempt to save some of the historic varieties that they were quickly losing in Italy. And there's now an American branch. And so for us, and this was really pretty early on in our farm's evolution, we realized that for animals, we wanted animals that were adapted to our region. So, you know, we live in a pretty humid region, mild winters. And so we wanted animals that were already, you know, if not completely adapted to those conditions, at least were familiar with them. Like, for instance, I wouldn't want to bring 
an animal that was adapted to Maine or the Northeast. I would prefer ones from the Gulf Coast region that were already adapted to humidity. And so that's what we've tried to do with the animals and the um, vegetables that we choose to raise here on the farm. But so the first, I'd say the best example of this is we have Gulf Coast native sheep. And they were our first large animal, well, and pigs, but we got them around the same time. But so I think we got those in, we brought those to the farm in 2014. And so they are one of the oldest breeds of sheep in the U.S. The Spanish originally brought them to the Gulf Coast and to Florida, and they've been able to date it back to the 1600s. And this is an incredible breed of sheep. We don't shear them, although I would like to get into wool. It's just another thing that, you know, it's a whole other avenue that I just haven't had time for. But one thing I liked about them is you also don't have to shear them. They, during the hot and humid summer months, they start to go bald on their bellies, their necks, their legs. So that already, it's just perfectly adapted to here. They So another thing that we have to worry about since we're a more temperate region is parasites. And we don't give any antibiotics or dewormers or anything like that. We just, we do natural dewormers. And so But parasites is something, you know, we just kind of have to worry about because since we don't have very heavy cold winters, that's not something that will break our parasite cycle. So we kind of have to get a bit creative in that. And Gulf Coast native sheep, they are already naturally resistant to parasites. Now, does that mean that, you know, they're magical and they'll never get parasites? No, no. But they do have a hardiness And they can carry a certain amount of parasite load and be just fine. So that's also something that we're looking for in these different kind of historic breeds of animals that we've brought to the farm. And so last year, we added Piney Woods cattle, which is the oldest breed of cattle in the U.S. They actually predate the Longhorns. And from geologic records, they think that Piney Woods were brought here in the 1500s by the Spanish. But something really cool about Piney Woods that we didn't even realize until we brought them here is that the Gulf Coast native sheep used to be called Piney Woods sheep. And they would run the two together across the Gulf Coast and the Piney Woods of Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana. And what was so funny is, so now we run our sheep and cattle together. And the gentleman that we bought our Piney Woods cattle from, we didn't know this until he brought them to the farm. He delivered them for us. And we were just chatting and he he recognized our sheep. And he was like, what kind of sheep are those? And he does the exact same thing still. He runs his Gulf Coast native sheep and then the Piney Woods cattle together. And so another kind of different thing that we do on our farm that you don't often see, we have all the animals together. And that's something kind of unique to us that (sighs) was another evolution in the farm. We used to keep everyone separate because that's the way everyone does things. And then we realized that we were just creating a lot of extra work for ourselves and there was absolutely no need to keep everyone separate. So we have pigs, cows, sheep, geese, goats, chickens, sometimes ducks and turkeys, not every year, but everyone's together. And you know what? They really pretty much all get along. Occasionally, there'll be a spat, but they always seem to work it out amongst each other. And if anything we've found, I love just watching the animals. I find it fascinating. They talk so much between each other, but they each have like a different language. So, but you just learn so much just like going out into the field and watching the animals. And it's it's one of my favorite things to do. You can learn so much. And so one thing we've learned is that when we got the sheep, they were so skittish. And they're sheep, so they're always going to be a bit skittish anyway. But when we started running the pigs, which are shorter and stouter than the sheep, with the sheep, it just kind of chilled the sheep out. 
because like they always had this shorter animal just like running all between them, totally chill, not concerned about anything. And at first, you know, when we put them together, the sheep were so freaked out. But then it just like totally chilled the sheep out. And so just like these different things that you, you start to see and the way we keep the animals and how that's evolved, it's kind of, it's one of my favorite like discoveries because you don't really see people very often keep everyone together and we do. And it's kind of like one big happy family and then occasionally there's a spat and then it gets worked out. And yeah, it's just, it's kind of a joy to see. How often do you have to rotate pasture then if you're keeping everyone together? Yeah, so it depends on the season. It really does. We used to have movable fencing and movable electronet fencing, and we would pretty much rotate them into a new section every other day. That's a lot of work moving all that fencing every other day, and we did that for quite a few years. And then a couple years ago, we made our lives much easier by sectioning off our pasture into big paddocks. And so we have about 20 acres of pasture, and then we have about 15 acres of woods, and then another pasture of about five acres. And so we kind of try to rotate everyone through that. And like the cows, for instance, sometimes we'll section them off and take them through the orchard. But We can't do that with the goats because they tend to ruin our trees. So it's very fluid, and sometimes we'll separate different animals off. But in general, they always have fresh pasture. And something, too, that we've learned is that if we go out to the animals and they're super and this in like the middle of the day after they've had their morning breakfast, if we go out and they're super noisy and yelling at us, it's like, okay, that is a sign that they need new pasture or that they need more food. When you go out to your animals in the middle of the day, you want them just like super chilled out, asleep, or just kind of roaming the field. You don't want them yelling at you. So we've also really learned to listen to our animals and to pick up clues, not just like visually of how our pasture and woodlands look, but also like hearing what the animals are telling us too. Have you watched the film, The Biggest Little Farm? Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, it just, the, the, some of the sentiments remind me of that film in the, in the essence of like observing the power in observing and actually listening and seeing how all of the little pieces work together. And it seems like you've been able to really tune into that. I wanted to read this short passage from this beautiful article that you wrote that I found online. And I wanted you to speak a little bit on it. There's magic to be found in hard work, putting hands to earth and soil. It's a rather strange kind of alchemy we farmers conjure up, making gold out of shit, food out of seeds, medicine out of plants, nourishment out of starlight, and between it all, life. Where does magic end and life begin? I love that passage so much um, that I had to write it down. But I'd love for you to kind of talk about the alchemy, the magic of farming, because it isn't easy work. Like the work that you are doing every day is very hard taxing work, but there's a reason why people are drawn to it and why people want to farm. And I think that part of that is the magic. Definitely. Yeah. It's alchemy. And I'm always surprised you know, that more people don't refer to farming as alchemy. Like you take seeds and you plant them in dark earth and they germinate and then, you know, they spiral out toward the sunlight out of total darkness. Like how did they, how did they know that what they were spiraling towards was the sun? It's just pure magic. And I feel like uh, for me, you know, when I put my hands in the soil. I'm channeling thousands of years of ancestors who came before me and did the same. And it's this connection that I feel we've lost in our modern world of cities and concrete. And it's very, very empowering and also comforting too, that, you know, you're doing something that has been done for thousands of years. You're growing food to feed not just yourself, but your family, your neighbors, your community. And, you know, as someone who has definitely struggled with anxiety, my mind 
always moves, you know, a million miles a minute, always racing to all these different places to just like go outside and just to do something with my hands. It automatically just like helps me to quiet my mind at the same time. And, you know, in this modern world of always moving, always being busy, I think it's important to sometimes slow down. And that in and of itself, I feel, is another alchemy. Just to like slow down and notice the leaves whistling in the wind. To notice, you know, the robins that come back every March. And to just stick your hands in soil and grow something. And that's that's something that I like to encourage everyone. Like, you know, you don't have to farm. I would say not everyone is cut out to be a farmer. Farming is very hard work. I would not just like, you know, give a blanket recommendation for everyone to farm. That wouldn't make sense. But no, I would give a blanket recommendation to say just grow something. You know, even if it's just a pot of basil or thyme off your back patio, just start it from seed and watch the process unfold. And I feel like you can't help but be drawn in to that magical act of from seed to soil to sunlight to plant to harvest. It, it's really, it's magic. I just wanted to give an enormous thank you to all of you listeners who have made contributions toward the production of this podcast. Every season, I spend about 100 hours preparing, writing, editing, interviewing, and distributing the podcast. And I have hard costs for my editor and for those hosting fees. And it really means so much to me that you find enough meaning and value in this podcast to pledge your support and to keep it going. And if you haven't had a chance to contribute, we've made it really easy for you. Just click the support button on the top of Urban Exodus website and pledge any amount that you like. Thank you again. I really couldn't continue to do this work without you. Slowing down is so important. And like the act of growing is a practice of slowing down because you can't force things <laughs> can't <laughs> force things to grow that's been so helpful to me when i moved i moved from like a mile a minute corporate world to growing food in my backyard and all of a sudden like it helped slow me down in a way that was just really really healthy and beyond the food that it provided just the mental health of growing was yes what i needed mm-hmm. i'd love to hear a little bit how you have found community and how you built community there and what your farm means to your community. Because I've driven through parts of the country where, you know, there's agriculture all around, but they aren't growing crops that you can actually eat per se without being processed. And so I'd love for you to kind of speak on, on what it means to be there and how your community has welcomed you. And if you feel like you've built a real solid foundation there. Yeah, so I would say it's definitely been a journey. When we first moved here, it was very difficult for the both of us. I mean, we were moving from Northern Virginia and D.C. and so much culture. And, you know, often when you're in a city, it's just like you don't even have to look for community. There are just so many different options. So, you know, when we first moved here, it was a struggle and especially because when we especially when we first moved to the shore there really were not a lot of people doing sustainable organic farming nothing like that i think there was maybe one other farm there was really no one and we were just kind of surrounded and it was very overwhelming and you know we don't go to church we were both raised evangelical so we kind of shy away from church But, you know, one great thing about church is it is easier to find community through church, and especially in a rural area. And so, you know, since we don't go to church, that was was something else that made it just a bit harder. But as our farm has grown, it's been so odd and kind of so beautiful. Like, we found that almost like community has found us through the farm. And our farm has just become like this entire hub of community. 
And, you know, at the beginning, we were giving away vegetables, volunteering at the food bank. We would go to like these very, very small town farmers markets that are just like in these small towns located, you know, like five, 10 minutes from the farm. We might make like less than a hundred bucks at one of these Saturday markets. But for us at the beginning, that wasn't really the point. The point for us was, well, you know, to be honest, it's good PR for a farm, but also just to like foster community. And we were able to meet so many different people through that. And we soon found that like people would just show up on our farm. Now, I am not recommending that you do that. (laughs) Yeah, always call and ask your farmer first. But is kind of refreshing that like, you know, we just get, and we still do, we get so many people just showing up on the farm or like they want to know how they can help. Can they volunteer? And so our farm has really become like this bustling hub of community that, you know, for an in- introvert like me, it was a little difficult to get used to at first, but I kind of love it. And I especially love the idea of it. And, you know, as we grew We had to stop doing those small town farmers markets, which I really hated doing because they were kind of like one of the the life sources of our farm at the beginning. And I hated giving them up, but they just, you know, they weren't financially feasible anymore. So we've had to like move to bigger city markets an hour or more away. But that is when we started our CSA. And what I love about the CSA is that that has allowed us to continue to foster community right here. So we have like the shore, it's two counties, and we do our CSA across both of those counties up and down the shore. And, you know, we have CSA members who are just around the corner, our neighbors just down the street. And so I love that even though we've had to give up the small town farmers markets and that sense of community, we've been able to keep it through the CSA while still being able to keep things financially viable and going to bigger city markets. I almost love that as a strategy for building community for small scale farmers. You know, I know that the farmers market circus can be really difficult, especially if you're only bringing home, you know, a hundred <laughs> bucks after yeah. setting up your tin and hauling all your vegetables. And you're like, okay, wow, my hourly rate right now is just, it's brutal. Yeah. But if you're looking at it just as a, I want to plant roots here, I want to build community, that could be a really interesting way for like, just factoring that into your, your business plan in a way. That's great. In addition to farming, you also do, you know, soil consults and workshops and you run the Edifon Institute. And I'd love to hear more about those pursuits. Yeah. So we love doing workshops. So we feel like since we've been so privileged having access to land and since land access is like just so brutal and difficult these days. One of the ways we love to give back is we love to do workshops. We love to have internships, apprenticeships. We love traveling to give workshops. Yeah, the Edifon Institute is really kind of this passion project of my husband's that grew out of his love for the soil. He's kind of a soil expert. He does consultations with everyone from like people that farm, you know, thousands of acres to backyard gardeners about their soil and their own unique situation. And so one of our big things in doing workshops and consultations is that there really is for farming no one size fits all plan. That's very kind of alluring and an easy sell, but each situation is so unique from all of your different growing conditions, climate, your soil. And so we like to take all of those things into account and then kind of help you figure out based on your goals, your situation, climate, what will work best for you and how to give you the tools and keys to be most successful in whatever, you know, your goals are, whether you're a big grower, just a gardener, just want to grow some of your own food. And that's another um, way too, that we can earn another source of income too. We're always kind of, we're kind of an astrologer once told us that we both 
can come across as very, very intimidating to a lot of people because we have tons and tons of energy, outward moving energy all the time. So we're always like, we always have like all sorts of different projects because, you know, we're trying to cover all our bases. And we always like to think that, you know, the more ways we try to cover the bases too, the easier it is on us us in terms of like, if we only grew vegetables, then everything would be riding on that in terms of making the farm financially successful. But we like, yeah, and we enjoy it too. We really enjoy teaching too. Well, and if there's a flood, <laughs> like yeah. before and you lose all your vegetables, I mean, I think that for small scale farmers in this day and age, with just competition, with industrial agriculture and subsidies and weather patterns changing, you like have to diversify your income streams in creative ways, or, you know, you're putting yourself at risk for all of those variables to a certain degree. So through all of your work, you're really encouraging others to appreciate work in harmony with and protect the natural world. What advice would you give to people who want to help work towards a better future for our planet and the creatures that reside here, but maybe they feel really overwhelmed at the enormity of the problems that we face and like they don't have the power or ability to make real impactful change? (sighs) Yeah, that's a good one. I feel like a lot of us feel this way. Yeah, I mean, I definitely feel this way. I mean, it's it's hard not to feel overwhelmed when you look at the climate situation and then just everything too within the last couple of years that have torn wide open all of the disparities in our society in general. But I always just like to say like cultivate a love of the earth. Like enjoy the spot where you are. Go outside and appreciate it. And two, again, like there's no plot too small, including your balcony. And just like grow something, even if it's just on your balcony. But, you know, it's important to remember that a well-tended garden can sequester more carbon than hundreds of acres under mediocre monoculture management. People, we often like to make it all about the system. And We absolutely need policy changes, but then at the same time, too, we need individual action. And I feel like, you know, one of the dangers of like listening to the doom and gloom news all the time is that it almost like immobilizes me to do anything. And I can't let myself be so overwhelmed by everything else going around me that I don't do anything. And so policy changes and individual action, they're not mutually exclusive. And the, you know, a a tendency is that we tend to get people who are only about individual action and, you know, they might tend to be more conservative. And then there are people on the other side that tend to be only about state action and they'll often tend to be more liberal. But we need both of those in order to tackle this gigantic issue. And what each individual is doing, what I'm doing, is just as important as policy. You need both. I think you're spot on. I think that there's this feeling of if you tune into all of the doom and gloom, you feel just like paralyzed, like impotent (laughs) to be able to do anything. But they kind of have to be running in tangent with one another. And maybe, you know, at least that empowers you to feel like you're doing something on a local level or, you know, even just on a household level to work towards something that's working towards good. The pandemic, we've talked about this, has really laid bare the enormous disparities in farming from land and capital access to profitability margins. In your opinion, what systemic changes do you think need to be made in agriculture in order to have a more equitable, accessible, and functional food system in the U.S.? Oh, the radical anarchist part of me just wants to like burn the whole system down. Like we need to like just start all over. But I know that that's not practical. And also I am well aware that that is not going to happen anytime soon because the people in charge have no incentive to do anything like that. And it's really frustrating because I feel like so often the burden is put on us 
as the consumer. And, you know, I don't think that's fair. I don't think it's realistic either. I do think that ultimately change needs to come from the top down. As consumers, you know, we can try our best, but how are we really going to change anything when you can get a really cheap hamburger and, you know, for most people, that's their only viable option that they can afford. They can't afford, like, you know, expensive grass-fed beef. And so, you know, we need to subsidize specialty crop farming. We need to subsidize vegetable and fruit farming. We have got to wean farmers off cash crop subsidies. Incentivize converting cornfields into prairies with rotational grazing. If we weren't growing corn, we wouldn't have to ship corn. And if we weren't growing and shipping corn and feeding it to cows locked in CAFOs, the cows wouldn't be creating huge toxic lagoons of shit. And the cows, if we converted it into prairie, they could eat, they could get almost everything they need from the grass right there. And yeah, I mean, I feel like there's so much talk about how to decrease emissions, but we're not doing simple things like just turning the cornfields back into prairies. Every time a plow enters the soil, carbon is lost to the atmosphere. And yeah, so, and also too, I feel like, you know, we need a new homestead act. We need to give people of color 40 acres and a tractor and a house. And, you know, that's originally what we promised enslaved people. And we're long overdue to pay that debt to figure out just more fair and equitable land access. They're just, yeah, it's it's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> I'm nodding my head to you <laughs> as, you're t- as you're going through all the pieces. <laughs> Have you ever considered getting involved in, in government or on a local level or working, you know, in trying to change these systems inside? In terms of like the local level, I feel like where my talents would be best used for all of these ideas is I try to work cooperatively with farmers. And so we've been kind of trying to do this from the very beginning, just working cooperatively with farmers, getting a bunch of small farmers together in the room and figuring out, you know, how we can share tools, how we can share land. One big thing for our farm that I'm always telling people is that, you know, we have so many ideas and I can't do all of them, but I would love for you to come onto our farm and like grow mushrooms in the field or take over an acre and experiment with some specialty crops. So in that way, I feel like trying to share our land and land access, that's kind of my way of trying to make just like a small imprint in what is just a huge mess. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. The last two years have been so difficult on so many levels. And I'm wondering, I mean, I know that you're based in a rural area and when we live on farms or we kind of live removed from larger metropolitan areas, like it almost to a certain degree, you can kind of isolate yourself from the happenings of the world. But even still, what has this time kind of taught you and how are you carrying that into your work and processes in the future? Yeah, I mean, so it's been interesting because in terms of the pandemic, If I'm being honest, like our day-to-day life didn't change all that much. We are farmers, so we're kind of tied to the farm, even more so when you have animals. And it's been funny, too, because like, you know, so many of my friends when I started this are like, oh, you're crazy. And then now, once the pandemic started, there was a lot of like jokes, maybe half jokes about how they're coming down to the farm and moving in with us now. And so it was really funny. Like, I felt like in a funny way, the pandemic, like, validated all of my life choices of the past decade to do these, like, seemingly crazy things. But then it also, for me, it helped me to see it in a bit of a new light of what important work we're doing. And just, you know, even in terms of growing 
food for your community. I mean, when the pandemic hit, we got a lot of new customers. We were selling so much food. We could barely keep up with it because of food shortages. There were egg shortages, supply chain issues. So just that in and of itself that oh, the work I'm doing is really important. Like I am feeding my community. This is good work that needs to be done. It was a good reminder too. Yeah, I mean, the last couple of years, even though my life, the day-to-day routine hasn't changed all that much, it's still, it's been rough. Like I miss traveling. I miss going to the city sometimes and art and culture and even just like, you know, being free to see family and friends. It's, It's different when, you know, it's just your life and you're on the farm and you're working versus kind of like this imposed thing of, oh, well, now you can't do all these different things that even if you didn't do all that often, when you did do them, you really enjoyed them. Yeah. And it was a break. I mean, it's like a reset button. The day-to-day workings of a farm and being tethered to a farm, I think that it's so important to be able to get off farm occasionally to just have that rest. Definitely. I have so enjoyed talking to you. How can people follow your journey, take a workshop with you? For people who are living on the coast of Virginia, how can people become part of your CSA? Yeah, so if you go to our website, perennialroots.com, that has all the information about our CSA, workshops, consultations, and Uh, You can follow me online, Perennial Roots Farm on Instagram, also Perennial Roots Farm on Facebook. I post all sorts of pictures of daily farm life, sometimes cute baby animals. Well, Natalie, it has been such a pleasure to speak with you this afternoon. We've run way over, but I just, I could talk to you all day. Thank you so much for joining me and for speaking about your story and your journey and all the wisdom that you have. Oh, thank you, Alyssa. This has been a joy. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Natalie McGill. I really appreciate her tenacity to learn how to live in harmony with the natural world and her passion for growing food for her community. Being the odd farm out in a sea of conventional growers is not easy, but it is really important work that they are doing. I admire Natalie's work as a lifelong learner and teacher, and her passion to preserve and honor ancestral farming practices, heritage breeds, and heirloom crops. In a time of climate uncertainty, we need diverse, resilient, and adaptable crops. Collectively, we must move towards regenerating our soils and localizing our food systems so communities aren't at risk when the supply chain fails. More people like Natalie are needed now more than ever. So I appreciate the role she takes in giving back and educating our future farmers. Thank you, Natalie, for sharing your story and wisdom with us. You can read more about Natalie and find photos and links to her farm and work on the blog by visiting urbanextus.com. Thank you all again for another amazing season. I really appreciate all of you listening. I appreciate you sharing. Have a wonderful new year. Hi friends, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Urban Exodus podcast. Urban Exodus is a labor of love and is only made possible by listener support. I do this work because the people I meet through this project give me energy and hope for the future. My mission is to promote the work of people manifesting good in the world. We are living in a time where there's an overwhelming feeling of dread, and I want this project to encourage people to be proactive and work towards finding creative solutions for both their individual happiness and our collective experience. You can support this work by clicking the support button at the top of urbanexodus.com, by buying an ad spot in an upcoming episode, by shopping our online store, or taking an in-person or online course through our workshops at Howhill Farm. We are also slowly getting our Patreon page together and we'll be adding bonus features and other content there. So check out patreon.com slash urban exodus to learn more. Another way to support is by giving us a five-star rating on iTunes and recommending Urban Exodus to your friends. Thank you again for helping me continue to do this work. I couldn't do it without all of you. 
You can find Urban Exodus on Instagram and Facebook at The Urban Exodus. To read more in-depth features on folks who ditched the city and went country, visit urbanexodus.com. Until next time, I'm Alyssa Hessler, and this is The Urban Exodus. 